everybody. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the show. What's been going on, Dan? Uh, not a lot. We haven't been it's on hot. for a while. Gosh, yeah, it's hot. It's real hot. I'm uh, doing some scouting, doing some work, but it's been so hot. It's been hard to do anything. Yeah, I've been, uh, me and Maddie bought a cargo trailer. I was telling you this before the show, but um, I've been working on it. We're going to try to make it into a little camper. So um, yeah, I've been talking about doing that for two years. Yeah. Just stop talking and actually do it. Yeah. It's pretty sweet. I'm, I'm pretty far. I mean, I've been working on it for like a few hours a day, every day since we got it this weekend. Um, I don't know. We'll see how long it takes me to get it done, but I'm on the electrical part now, which I just put the electric in this, this evening before the show here. And yep. I pretty much work until I'm uh, dying of thirst and, uh, overheating and then I stop for a while because it gets to like feels like it's 120 inside that cargo trailer right now <laughs> working inside that thing but I haven't didn't do much uh like deer wise this week just it's rough out there when it's 95 degrees and humid and hot and um me and Eric went out uh scouting and just about died in the heat I think yeah. I made it to the truck by the time I was gonna pass out um <laughs> I think we've got one new spot, but we tweaked a couple of uh, spots we knew about. Yeah. And uh, along the way, we came across a fresh kill fawn from coyotes. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was really hot out, and it still had uh, fresh blood that wasn't coagulated on, it, on its insides. Really? Yeah, little fawn. A lot of them go that way. You Some people me- already saw it because my phone accidentally posted it. <laughs> <laughs> Dan got a new phone. He's having fits with it. Yeah. What kind did you get? What kind of phone did you get? I got the same phone. Oh, did I you? I just don't have I don't, you know, I smashed my last one. Mm-hmm. Um, so since I smashed it, I decided I better not put a covering on this one. Right. And because of that, it keeps just, if I don't turn it off. It's bouncing around in my pocket. It starts sending messages and stuff. And that could be bad. I don't like phones. Yeah. When I met you, you had a flip phone. Yeah. Like... They work just fine. <laughs> I mean, you were you were a flip phone guy until what, probably 2018 or something like that. Yeah, I remember uh, hunting public making fun of me. They kept filming me every time I'd use it. Yeah. <laughs> That's probably why so many people just loved you on that thing. Like your that original hunt, you probably just had the the flip phone and the old bo- old, old forge bow that you were. Uh, yeah, well, your... it wasn't my good looks. <laughs> <laughs> Depends who you ask, I guess. Right, that lady at the what was it, Fleet Farm or whatever, your cashier. Find uh, a new energy drink. Oh no! I'm getting, really? I'm getting like Rick. Oh, what well, is that? Got a little teddy bear on it. Oh, that's hilarious. Something to do with uh, you lost your energy, now you found your energy or something. <laughs> stuff's really good. It's only 10 calories. You found it at the pig. There you go. Nice. I should, uh, at Piggly Wiggly. Piggly Wiggly. There's a store. I know. I guess, uh, oh, you have that done by you? No, but they're, I think they're down south a lot of them are, aren't they? I thought oh. that was like a southern thing. Mm. Maybe I'm wrong. No, we don't have those. We have like JC food stores around here, which is Kroger. Kroger owns them now, but um, yeah. This is uh, um, cherry lemonade flavor. That's what I like. And that's only 10 calories. Usually anything that tastes good has like 8 million calories in it. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Um, Before we get going, you want to do this shoot giveaway? Because I know all the, all the people I, I've seen most of them on here tonight. So, um, I know they're probably itching to, to um, see who won. Um, okay. I get. I guess before we do that, though, uh, if you guys have questions for us, just uh, put a question mark before the comp the question and um, leave it in the chat, and we'll get to them. We'll do Collins tonight too. Um, we do have. I was going to talk about a news story after we do the the shoot, but you ready to do this, Dan? Yeah. Can you switch me? Like, oh. yeah, one second. Let me. All right, here we go. All right, everybody. I think we're going to do it. Here we go. There you go. 
All right, I think I got it. Is it yep. working? Go, go for it. All right, you ready? Mm -hmm. Let's go. The anticipation. <laughs> I don't know if Dan will be able to hear us anymore. There they are. It's not upside down. <laughs> <laughs> oh well. All right. for it. I don't know, that looks like a perfect shot. Yeah. It looks like dead center. <laughs> Deer are in trouble this year. Oh, it's not dead center. Who is it? It is just off of here. And we got Johnny and Nick. All right. I'm pretty sure they're on tonight. I saw them, I think. There you have it. Here's the bull. I'll see you inside. All right. Here we go. Let's see here. Wait till he pops back down here. There he is. You're back. I'm back. <laughs> Johnny and Nick. I know they're on here. I uh, I saw them earlier. So. So who just uh, Johnny or Nick? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> You have to, Johnny or Nick, just reach out to me. Um, I'll throw my email in the comments here real quick, and then we can get you here. Uh, your yeah, I can, I can mail it to them, or they can, uh, they can swing by, pick it up, and hang out for a while. Yep, not sure where I'm they're from. Um, you could just, I sent my You can uh, stand out by the road and drink beers and throw rocks at my neighbor. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Oh, uh, that's funny. That's cool. I think people will enjoy that. Maybe we'll do that again sometime. I'd like to do something for our hundredth episode. So that's like not that far away. We only got 10 more to go and we will be at a hundred, but, um, I thought it was, Hey, that was that. Is that guy on? Have him call in if he's on. Yeah, we could do that. Um, was that your, uh, I know you were elevated on your shot there. Was that your, is that your new like elevation thing that you're. Yeah. So I'm going to be able to shoot out of the building over there. Yeah. Gotcha. Out of the back door. So someday when that's done, like in the, you know, 2030s or something, maybe I'll have uh, <laughs> some 3D decoys out there. And... <laughs> Cause it, it looked like it was, uh, you look like you're pretty high up or, you know, fairly high up compared to the target. Um, yeah, Johnny I, or Nick or whoever you are, <laughs> I put the StreamYard link into the um, into the chat. Just click on that and 
you'll you'll pop up here and I can I can bring you into the chat the live show. And if you don't want to, that's fine too. It's if you're you know not not your thing, that's that's cool too. But you're more than welcome to hop on. Um, well, while we're we're waiting to see if they get on or he gets on or she gets on, um, you want to talk about this news story that uh, I sent it to you just a little bit ago. I don't know if you got to read it, but some states are um, kind of going in an opposite direction as what uh, of what a lot of people are, or a lot of states have been doing lately, and they're allowing um, baiting back into the regulations. Well, if you ask me, all these states are backwards. I mean, yeah. the regulations they have at all these states are backwards. I mean, they're not keeping up with modern times. I mean, they don't know how to manage states. Here's the, uh, just so we give them some credit here. It's from Deer and Deer Hunt. And essentially, they, uh, this coming year, it is Minnesota and Alabama are going to allow um, baiting back into these counties you can see here in Minnesota and then uh, I think and Alabama. You made it fully legally up there now too, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So just something newsworthy, I guess, that we I was going to – why do you think they're doing that? What, what do you think the reasoning is? I don't know. I think they think they get some more hunters and it's – um, um, I think they think it's a popular thing. And I think yeah. it is popular. I, I think – they do have some people that uh, like that, um, that style of hunting, but I think your most of your hunters don't. Yeah, I mean, uh, to me, I I could care less how somebody gets their their deer or whatever, but uh, when it affects you, is when it's a problem. Yeah, it's you know when when debating becomes so widespread that it's affecting people hunting normally and um, wanting to hunt a natural movement. That's where it becomes a problem. And it's kind of interesting to see states go kind of backwards in direction from, you know, um, what everybody wanted to get away from. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's weird. And I don't know, maybe maybe we're sheltered from it just because we are so engulfed in the, like, public land and mobile hunting thing. Maybe maybe there is a whole freaking form about bait and deer and all that. You know, I, I don't know, but. It's kind of, it is it is weird. It's uh, something I didn't expect to see, yeah. I guess. It's kind of um, interesting. It looks like Alabama really went a backwards route. So, I mean, yeah. you either make it legal or you don't. And what they did is they made it legal on private land. So, mm -hmm. once again, people who have private land have an even bigger benefit, you know. Yeah. And it. Um, I feel like it'd be just a mess if you made it legal in public, though. I mean, people would be, you know. Maybe, maybe not. But you just think about like uh, like the marsh I hunt, yeah, or any marsh that you hunt. It's a, a bowl of like a thousand acres or, or something, surrounded by farms. Mm -hmm. All those farms start baiting, and all of a sudden you're kind of void of deer in the marsh. At least yeah. for a portion of deer, at least for like uh, like uh, for the the winter time when there's a lack of food. Yeah, you know so. Yeah. It's, it's kind of, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't really mind baiters if that, you know, kind of like, uh, I think about the old guy who, uh, can barely walk. He can just get out there. He doesn't have time to scout and stuff and sitting on a bucket. If you put out some bait, maybe you could kill a deer. I got no problem with that. It's, but, uh, it just becomes so widespread. It kind of affects everybody. Yeah. No, that's a good point. Um, anyway, Johnny's down here. Let's add him to the stream. Hey, 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 Johnny, you're you're on mute, Johnny. There should be Get a button. At, should be a button at the bottom. It says mute. Just there you there are. There you go. Oh, there we go. All Congrats. Right. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Really now we know when Nick ain't getting the bow. It's Johnny's getting the bow. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that bow's going elk hunting and blacktail hunting. Nice. nice. Yeah. Where are you from? Where are you from, Johnny? Uh, I live in Oregon. Oh, cool. Cool. Yeah. So, nice. yeah, I might also take it. Uh, we have whitetails out here, too, so I might get into that also. I know. Uh, cool. I've heard. I used to listen to a, a podcast, and it was called Trad Quest, I think. But the guys are from Oregon. Yeah. And they, they mentioned Dan on the podcast, like, 
a long time ago. And I guess blacktails are pretty similar to whitetails in the manner of how you can hunt them. Yeah. And they, and they said they get, there's no blacktail, you know, it's a pretty small niche, you know, and there's no information on blacktails hardly at all. And they said that they listened to Dan to help them with blacktail hunting. Yeah. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons, that's one of the reasons why I'm on here. Awesome. Yeah. I, I, I take it since, since you're from Oregon, Dan's probably gonna have to ship you that bow. He, he probably can't come and throw rocks at his neighbors with him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'd be a trip. Oh, <laughs> uh, cool. Well, hopefully you get something with it. Yeah, if I do, I'll definitely send out some photos and, you know, that sort of stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Um, all right, Johnny. Well, uh, congratulations and thanks for, for watching and entering the contest and all that you made you it to in. Josh. yeah I'll, I'll get it from you I, I i sent that you got my email there now it's in the it's in the chats johnny okay um okay and i'll i'll uh and if you don't uh i i got your your youtube stuff so i'll get a hold of you somehow yeah yeah um, before i go i just wanted to say thank you guys for what you do and everything i know it's a lot of hard work and stuff and it's really informative even out here in the west so you know just keep it rocking and rolling so <laughs> appreciate the plan thank you so much johnny yeah Just thank you okay bye yep. bye all right cool that's neat he's from oregon yeah. um but yeah i i've heard multiple people that hunt blacktail say that that that's how they get their information is from whitetail content so we got a new member here well, it's not letting me add them, but anyway. Um, yeah, if you guys want to, we'll just, me and Dan will just go through some questions here uh, the rest of the, the show. And uh, maybe be a little shorter show than normal, just depends on how many questions we have. We just wanted to um, get the, the bow to the, the winter and do all that. So uh, let's see here. Tony had a question. He says, when you see a good buck glassing, how often do you try to keep tabs on him? You want to answer first? Yeah. Uh, like if I see one that I'm like one of those deer where you're like, okay, I'm going after that deer this year. I'm like probably weekly trying to find him in a field somewhere, you know, running trail cameras around. I mean, it, you're, you're um, as, as least intrusive as you can, you want to keep a, uh, keep tabs on him. So don't, I, I would, I would, try your hardest to know where he's at at all times, but at the same time, don't overdo it and ruin it for, uh, for your chances during the season, if that makes sense. Um, what do you think, Dan? For me, it's about really being unintrusive, but really keeping on tabs. Uh, hopefully it's an area you can keep glass in him. You, you know, a lot of times it's such thick areas you can't, or in your case, um, back in the Hills, you know, way off the road. Yeah, right. Um, but, uh, I try to keep tabs so I know a general area where the thing's hanging and I can get uh, general general trends of where it's moving um, because they do tend to shift a little before season. But late summer and uh, September ain't really too different in Wisconsin. Now, it can be a pretty different in uh, Indiana where it opens October 1st. Yeah. Um, but uh, at least having an idea where he's at, I think – I, I would have a hard time getting in there with cameras and putting cameras in because once I know he's there, I already have a target established. Yeah. I really just want to keep tabs. I don't want to bump them. So I try to do it from a vehicle or from an observation stand usually. And I uh, usually keep the cameras for locating new bucks. Yep. Yeah, that's a good point. In my mind, I already, the, the couple deer I had in my mind, I already had cameras out uh, this time of mm. year, you know, already placed. Um, I just, I just knew there was a good one in the area. Um, but all right. Lynn had a question. He says, I've been glassing and finding majority of the deer on hilltops. Any guesses why it's been extremely hot here. I figured maybe they get more wind on top. Hmm. I don't know. Kind of odd. Yeah. I don't know. Um, you know, I guess it's probably, uh, it can be regionally specific too. Like uh, some areas, uh, 
side hills are just are thicker and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I I right. see them on tops too sometimes, and sometimes also still, like usually hills though mostly, but yeah, also like you know. the tops is like you can just see them better too. You know, it's like usually if they're up top somewhere, they're sky lit, and you can you just see more deer up there because you can see. Um, I don't know if there's probably I don't know if there's any 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 reason why they would be up there. Um, I've seen some pretty good trail systems on tops when it's narrow hills. Yeah. You know, like Ohio. Yeah. You know, I wonder if he's like, like, I wonder if you're talking about Lynn, like on like tops and crop fields or like, how are you seeing them? I guess this time of year, cause it's hard to see deer in the woods right now, you know, um, I guess at least I driving down the road. Would, right. That's a good question. But anyways, um, Zeke has a question. It's a pretty good one too. Does bucks and farmland with less bedding act differently than areas with way more bedding to choose from when it comes to summer to fall shift and winter to summer? <clears throat> it's a lot to digest. It's like a multifaceted uh, yeah. question. Start start with the with the, the do bucks act different with less bedding? Uh, I think so. I think uh, I've noticed that uh, places that have uh, more deer, you know, more deer on the property, like a higher population, mm -hmm. the bigger bucks tend to move a lot more in daylight and, and more often, you know, earlier. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think the, the smaller deer get them up. You know what I mean? They're not the first ones up, but they get up earlier and move around in daylight more. Yeah. In higher population. And I've seen that. You know, um, in a lot of places I've gone, where in lower oh, yeah. populations, I think there might be a little more paranoia about moving solely. You know, when you're alone, and they, right. you know, um, so I would I would say, yeah, I, I think that uh, it does affect them. Yeah, uh, what I was a facet. Oh, go ahead. I would agree. Uh, I was I was thinking the this kind of the same thing when you mentioned the um when there's higher number of deer in the area it just seems like you know deer or bucks in particular they'll use that advantage of other deer out in the field or just passing by and they don't have to worry about as much stuff because there's some uh, dummies out there for them essentially you know <laughs> um especially old does and all that you know that are kind of trying to keep track of yearlings and everything else they're still pretty aware of what's going on even though they're out in the middle of the war zone per se more often than bucks are um second part is um and i'm not real sure exactly what zeke means here but he says dude uh, let's see here they act differently than areas with way more bedding to choose from when it comes to summer to fall shift and winter to summer shift mm -hmm. i don't I don't think the amount of bedding is going to have a big de deal to do with the shift. Yeah. But uh, I think it has more to do with what kind of bedding it is. I mean, there's bedding that's specific for winter. There's bedding that's summer specific. Yeah. Um, I think it's really more that uh, in every case scenario, in my opinion, you have to learn um, what deer are bedding there and why and where, you know, um, I don't think you can just generalize that to a property having less bedding or more bedding. Um, right. As to what's going to cause them to shift to that property. I think most of the time the winter shifts come to, you know, where they're going to food. Now, a summer to fall shift is, can be going to food and it can also be going to cover, um, depending. I mean, um, the winter shift is usually to cover and to um, food. But uh, I guess they they both do. But it's just the differences in the timing. I mean, um, you know, you look at summertime, there's uh, cover everywhere. They can bed kind of where they want. Um, but they're still going to look for certain types of, you know, things. Like right now, I'm seeing a lot of them down low in wet areas where it's kind of, you know, cooler. Yeah. Um, but uh, come fall, you might see them up on, you know, little higher ground or in, in more specific spots, like at the ends of islands and stuff like that. Um, yeah. You got an add on? Not really. I mean, 
I mean, I, it's a hard question to answer. I, I, I've never like kept track of how much betting's in a location and how a deer, you know, moves from season to season from, uh, you know, you, you know, when I looked at uh, Dave's farm, it always frustrated me that there's like better betting on the neighbors. Mm -hmm. It's like if I didn't have good food on Dave's, like if I didn't put in food plots, those deer, um, it'd be a hard pull to get them to come over. But if I had good food, they would use some of the betting I had. And the biggest advantage I had is that um, the betting on the neighbors got harassed a little bit. Certain areas didn't, so it was kind of tough, but right. I didn't harass the betting areas. I stayed out of there as much as possible. There's certain areas that, you know, I had stands on the fringe and I'd only go in for a kill, maybe once a year or twice a year. Yeah. Um, and that brought more of men. But uh, there's always that frustration of better betting on neighbors, you know. Yep. Moose Junction Hunter, thanks for joining the membership, man. Um, let's see here, Brian, I did not get your Facebook message yet, man. He said he had a long one for us and, uh, was going to send it through Facebook. So I'll kind of keep an eye out see if I get a, um, notification from Facebook. All right. Would it be a good idea? K K B K P S says, would it be a good idea to hunt the backside of an oxbow? Maybe even shoot over the water in the morning and early season when, go to shoot over an exit trail at different oxbows for the evening. Sure. I don't There's see a problem with that. I've actually yeah. considered that myself. Yep. Right. You know, a lot of places you're not allowed to shoot over water. Uh, there's a lot of places you can't shoot deer in water. Yeah. I've had actually people accuse me of poaching for shooting them in swamps. I mean, that's a little push in the law, but <laughs> yeah, that's kind of, it's really yeah. so that you don't shoot them swimming mostly. Right. Because that's kind of like too much of an advantage, they think. But yep. Yep. Um Joe asked how many milligrams of caffeine is in your energy drink, Dan. Mm. Uh it's not as much as Monster. This is 150. It says I think. But I noticed that I don't get the kick out of it. I get out of a can of monster. Yeah, 150 milligrams. Monster doesn't tell you. They don't want you to know. <laughs> they got all kinds of stuff in them things. Uh, let's see here. Has Dan or Josh been practicing with Bo recently? I still don't have my bows back from um, Steve Pagel. Oh, really? Hopefully I uh, he didn't drop that or something because he usually has them back pretty quick. Yeah. Better check on that. Yeah. I have been a little bit. Yeah. I've been shooting my longbow and my compound a little bit. Not a ton, but um, enough to get my get things uh, grooved you, in. You saw that uh, that shot I did with the uh, with my uh, last year's model of the um, Prime. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess I'm good. <laughs> That's your warm up shot for this year. <laughs> I plan on uh, starting to shoot like crazy as soon as I get the bows back. Yeah. Yeah, hopefully it gets them to you soon. Um, it's season is creeping up fast now because we will have the Mobile Hunter Expo, and then all of a sudden it's going to be a September, you know. Um, so it's crazy. Speaking of that, I guess we we are going to be at the Mobile Hunters Expo doing a kind of a live event, like a show. Uh, on I think it's going to be on Saturday, so. If you guys are in the Kalamazoo, Michigan area, come and hear us out for the um, that event. Have you been to the Mobile Hunter Expo? I've Dan? never been to one. Mm -mm. I haven't either. Um, a lot of I know a lot of people uh, that have gone and really enjoy them, but it's kind of a smaller event, more for people that hunt like public land, mobile hunting type thing. So I think anybody that's watching us right now would probably get a kick out of it. Kick out of it. Um, so people are asking how far a shot was that, Dan? That was a long shot. It was about <laughs> <laughs> seven or eight yards. Uh, 
they look longer on film, but uh, it was pretty close. Chris asked about the camera arm. If you're going to release one, um, that's a good question. Um, uh, it's ready to rock. I submitted it to uh, Mario, and uh, it's just a matter of uh, when it gets released. Um, oh, nice. Oh, it's in manufacturing or what? But uh, we have a finished version, and I don't know how long. Cool. Um, let's see here, Dan. If you had to make just, if you had to make an educated guess, how many two hundred inch bucks would you guess live in Wisconsin right now? Right now. Um... I would say at the end of July, a little a few more, but um, as far as this season, what'll be around? Yeah, I would probably say um, I don't know, maybe fifty. If I had to take a guess, yep. And I would say that probably um, um, forty of those in the southern half. Yeah, that's a hard question to answer. I don't know what percentage. It is. It is. It's it's a guess. I mean, um, I do know that uh, every year there's a, there's a few around where I live. I mean, so if you started expanding that across the state and the counties, certain counties never seem to produce them. And certain counties produce more, but uh, you know, there's a few in a few counties. It's going to add yeah. up to. In the 50 range, probably for sure. Yeah. I think a lot of them don't get shot too. So, yeah. I, uh, I was just thinking out loud here. I Googled it, but I was thinking about what percentage of bucks, um, killed our 200 inch deer. And if you, as far as Boone and Crockett and Pope, Pope and Young go, there's, uh, less than 2% of all entries are over 200 inch. So, and that's not, not a great, um, I, mean, yeah, I wonder how many are shot in Wisconsin in a year. So. I don't know. Let me see. Let's see if I can. Um, not very many. What's your guess? My guess would probably be uh, seven to ten. If you include non-typicals. I mean, well, I guess not, not after uh, net. Are you talking net? Yeah, prob probably because I think that's the only way you're going to know okay, because all so the net net maybe there's only going to be a handful. maybe four or five yeah a handful yeah I don't see any information on that kind of thing on here but it can't be very many it's crazy yeah, how rare, rare you're talking it is. net yeah, I think you'd probably put that fifty number down a little bit too yeah but uh, which I mean. I, I don't know how you would keep track of it because all the scoring uh, organizations all have some type of, type of net for the most part, or at least Boone and Crockett and um, Pope and Young yeah. does. I mean, there's – I know a few people who have shot them, and I, I've seen a few that you know are 200 inches, and nobody ever yeah. gets them. And it seems like uh, once every two or three years I have one around that I know of personally you know um and i know i don't yeah. know about all the deer. sure um yeah i mean i can honestly like around here i can think of like a a handful of people i know that's killed a 200 inch deer in their life you know um mm -hmm. of, or at least of, in my life so <laughs> it's crazy how rare it is um it's pretty crazy how some people have killed multiple ones too you know just mm -hmm. All right, Gary, he asked, um, is buck bedding, this is probably something we could go over just for people that are uh, newer to the channel, Dan, is, is buck bedding the same or different early season, pre-rut, rut, and late season? No. <laughs> <laughs> you could do seven shows on that. Um, yeah. Yeah, you got to uh... – I say it all the time, be the detective. You have to be able to look at the bedding and determine what time it's being used and for what reasons. And, uh, you know, you can have a spot that is really killer bedding. And um, 
the first couple of weeks of September. That's why I always laugh at these people who will say, um, I'm saving my best spots for rut. I don't even hunt to rut because I don't want to pressure those deer. Man, there's spots that I hunt where you can kill giants in September, but you won't kill nothing the rest of the year in that yeah. spot, you know? Um, so it's all specific to timing. You know, they'll bed in a spot because of food. They'll bed there because of does. They'll bed there because of cover that changes through the season. Um, there's a lot of reasons they pick spots. Now, there is what I would call primary bedding. And primary bedding would be used year-round. But even that has a peak at certain times. And what I yeah. find through cameras and through observation and through hunting journals and stuff through the, through the history of my career is that you have about a two-week peak period in most bedding areas when it's the best time to be there and your cameras will show that and stuff if you have cameras in those bedding areas or not in them because that usually does damage but on the outskirts and you just leave them and don't touch them what i'm finding is that those you know you hit that two-week period once you have that figured out if you stay out of there to that two-week period and that changes i've seen mm -hmm. it be you know, September, I've seen it be the first week of October. I've seen it be, you know, the last week of October. I've seen it be the first week of November. And, you know, I've seen these uh, spots that I'll call uh, rut bedding. And this I didn't learn to about 10 years ago. And uh, me and Mario kind of stumbled on it um, and started figuring this out. And I started looking at it more and more and more after that was these bucks that will specifically bed in a spot to monitor doe bedding. Mm -hmm. And what you find is a bed you can hardly see because it's only used for four or five days. Right. But the uh, they're tore up with rubs usually because they're aggressive and they're, you know, seeking this dough out that's coming into heat. And it, once you know about those spots, you can go there the next year with that timing and you have you won't even have much sign there, that, you know, until that buck is, you know, comes in that timing. But yeah. you got about five days when that buck is going to be there. You know, so it really has a lot to do with timing. So, mm -hmm. yes, the, the beddings are vastly different than those time frames. I would say even to the point of week to week. Yep. And you talk, we talk a lot about, um, you know, trail camera data over the years and how, you know, you'll see certain bucks come into an area September 18th and the to the 20th, they'll be in there November second to the four fifth he's in there for some reason and that's what you got to figure out you know why he's in there and what's drawing him drawing him to live in there those particular days of the year and it can be just a couple of days like you said anybody um, who runs trail cameras year after year in the same spots will tell you that uh they get shocked all the time when the same buck that they saw the year before will be at the same date the next year yeah. showing up i mean almost to the day yeah typically i see it like for me, at least, it's always like that, those rut time frames when you see those kind of come and go ones, but they're always very consistent. Um, but you can have them based on food if it's acorns and or you know if there's certain crop rotations where things are changing, just all kinds of things that. And you can have it every other year too, based on like biannual crops. Yeah, or acorns just drop yeah. every other year. Um, yeah. yeah, that's all the stuff you just gotta. It, and it's not something you can just like, we can't just tell you here on the show. Like you just got to kind of do it for a few years and you figure it out, you know, study that kind of stuff. Gary uh, is really good at that. I mean, he keeps very good tabs on all his trail cameras and, you know, he, he has to, to the date, how many bucks were all in, on each camera and everything else. And he can tell you like this area, this is when you need to be here, here, here. And it's, it's very, uh, good information that he collects um all right onward dan when do you plan on hunting iowa early season rut or late season uh, i'm gonna be there right away probably and then let the cards fall where they fall and probably just keep going back yep Hunt until you i like the early season there i've done really well early season there i haven't killed any bucks in iowa in early season but yep. uh, i've got some pretty cool encounters and past some pretty nice bucks um in iowa in early season like the first week and what i like is not the pressure you know um right. right i like that last week of october um before everybody takes their vacations to go down there 
um, even the residents, you, you know, if you can get there before that onslaught where there's guys in every tree, you're more likely to get those deer that are uh, moving around a lot more in daylight. You know, somebody else is usually going to shoot it before you get a chance, you know, in public if you uh, go in that pressure situation. And that's not to say rut, peak rut is not a bad time to be hunting, but uh, it's a good time for bad hunters to get lucky. Mm. And a lot of people can just go down there and kill a buck and rut because they get lucky. But if you got skill, I think you can do better in that pre-rut, you know, like the, a week or so early when they start laying down a lot of sign, but it's on still on a pattern. You know what I mean? You can go in and read that sign and figure out, okay, it's coming from here. It's going there. What's going on with the bedding? How close is it? You know, and, and put two and two together. Um, in early season, I mean, um, I've done really well just uh, reading maps and going in and looking at sign and stuff. Um, and uh, getting on them. I mean, when you're in a game rich area like that, I don't think you have to be rut. Yeah. Yep. It's going to be an exciting season for us. I think I'm going to go to, I may go scouting in Kansas here in a few weeks if I can get a, um, a long weekend free here. I want to go and I've never been there. I'd like to just go and look at the general area and kind of just see what I'm getting into, you know, mm -hmm. just buzz out there for a weekend and then um, almost just like a glassing, you know, I think it's pretty open in, the, in most of those areas and just glass and see if I can find something. Um, at least just get a feel for the place. So I'm not kind of running around my head cut off the first couple of days. Um, all right. Mark S asks, what's your opinions on using stabilizers on hunting bows? I don't know. I never really got into them. Um, yeah. They always got away and I just kind of like the regular bow, but uh, you're probably a better opinion on that than I am. You're more yeah, into I equipment than I am. Yeah. Um, I run like a six inch one on the front of my bow um, just to help a little bit. Here's my opinion on stabilizers. I don't know if it's right or not. If you're a very good shot, I think they help you a lot. You know, I think, um, you know, if you're, if you can shoot at 80 yards and it helps you keep the bow steadier and all that kind of stuff. Great. But you know, if you're, if you're shooting 30 yards and in and your groups are, you know, whatever, a half dollar. I don't, I don't know if you need all that extra weight and stuff hanging off of it. Um, that's just, that's just my opinion. Doesn't mean it's right. Um, but I think guys that are really good bow shots can really tune in their stuff to where, you know, that stabilizer can make their groups go from this big to this big, you know, <laughs> and, and that's, that's great if that's uh, your thing, but if your groups are, you know, a pie plate at 20, I don't know if it's going to like change your life um, per se, but I can usually hit a hay bale at 20. Yeah. 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 Good. Good. Maybe you should throw a stabilizer on there. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, that's just my opinion. I, I've never, I, I've ran a back bar one, one year I tried it and I can't really tell you I shot so like so much better that I keep using them. But um, anyway, let's see here. All right, this is a question MT asks. Maybe this is Maddie, Maddie Talker. All the, with all the information that's available to everyone and all the content you provide, what percentage of hunters do you come across still setting up in the wrong spots? I don't know about wrong spots. Um, setting up in spots that seem like you scratch your head and ask yourself why. Yeah. A lot, a lot. But... You, you know, it reminds me of a time I went out with the guys, uh, you know, Dave Dockstader and a bunch of other guys. We went, were gun hunting. We we're going to go do this push. And we get to this spot and there's a car there and we don't want to push something that somebody's in. But we look out and the guy is like 50 yards from his car in a grass field and it's just grass fields forever. And he's looking down at the woods, you, you know, um, waiting for a deer to come out into the alfalfa at the main parking lot. And you're thinking, what is he thinking? You know, you really think a deer is going to walk out into the, you know, the, the alfalfa field uh, <laughs> and eat alfalfa, you know, a couple days yeah. into gun season, right. you, you know, when people are constantly traipsing way back there. So we walk in there and I kind of joked about it, 
to the guys, you know, and I remember Dave looking at me and going, you never know, Dan, there might not be a bad spot if a deer went to escape. And I'm like, nah, it's a bad spot, Dave. <laughs> we walked in the woods, kicked up a giant buck, it ran out and the guy shot it. So, <laughs> so it was a good spot. Yeah. You, you know, um, what, necessar- what necessarily makes a spot a good spot is that a deer could come by there and you'd kill it. Right. You know, otherwise we're all in bad spots until the one day we're in a good spot, right? Yeah, most days um, you're in a bad spot. <laughs> But as far as not setting up like B style, I think uh, the majority of people I see don't set up B style. Yeah. Um, I'm just starting to see now a trend where you're starting to see more and more people do it. I think more and people are more and more people are getting turned on to it or learning and uh, are becoming more skilled. But for sure, the majority are not. Now, um, when I hunt around my home and if I hunt in a marsh behind my house, I see a lot of it. And I see a lot more non-resident cars and all that kind of stuff. But because of that, I don't do as much hunting around home anymore. I travel a little more, a little further out. Yeah. When I get away from home, I see a lot less of it. When I get to other places, I don't, you know, you'll see a, an island on a map and the cattails and you're like, oh my God, somebody's got to be hunting. And you go out there and there's no sign of anybody ever setting up there and you sit there and you see deer. So yeah. uh, I don't, I still think a lot of people don't hunt our way. You know, I think, yeah. I still think we're the minority. Yeah, I think for sure. Um, Dylan asks if you've ever tracked bucks down in the snow and killed one. Um, I killed one in the snow, but uh, um, I don't know if you'd actually call it tracking. I started it tracking, but I kind of ran across the buck before I got on his track. <laughs> and I wounded him. And then yeah. I tracked him for two days and ended up killing him. But he was he was wounded. I hit him in the leg. Yeah. But I otherwise, have. no, I haven't killed one tracking. I passed a few tracking. I've jumped a few I didn't want to shoot. Yeah. I've never I've never legitimately killed one tracking. But I honestly have not put a lot of time into that. Yeah. It's not my Same. thing. My thing is that cat and mouse game. I just I wouldn't feel as as and I'm not knocking it at all. For some people, that's the way to hunt, and mm-hmm. there's a lot of enjoyment in it. But for me, it's about hunting a specific animal, you know, figuring out his ways and outsmarting them. For some people, it's, you, tracking you know, follow, yeah, tracking them down. Follow yeah. them. And for me, that yeah. doesn't do it. If your method for tracking, if your method for killing a big buck in southern Indiana was tracking them in snow, you'd only hunt like once every 10 years. So <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I, don't know. I remember when uh, I was younger and I really wanted to, you know, go track them down in the north woods. I wanted to experience it. Mm-hmm. Because, uh, you know, a lot of hunting is about experiences. You want to try different right. things, especially when you're right. younger. And I went up to uh, you know, the top of the state and uh, up by Bayfield County and um, went and got on some deer tracks, started following. And all of a sudden, I hear some dude yelling, and there's a guy in a stand over a pile of bait, and that's where the deer tracks were going. So I back off and start tracking another one. Also, the tracks start picking up more tracks, more tracks. I hit a bait pile. Some dude is like, what the hell, man? You're just wandering through the woods. You know, people are trying to hunt. You know, it's like, yeah. Okay. So I got another yeah. track and had the same thing happen. And I spent the weekend of uh, ticking people off. And I, I really yeah. didn't enjoy that at all. Yeah. I could see that happening for sure. Blue color sportsman. He, uh, oh, I was going to say before we answer this one, I think I've, I've hunted more days in the snow in Wisconsin than I have in Indiana for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, it's going up there late season stuff. So I haven't, don't have any experience tracking deer. All right. Blue collar sportsman. I'm wondering if there's a substitute for milkweed. He's I'm from upstate South Carolina and I am wondering if I could use dandelion pods instead of milkweed. I have milkweed, but I have to buy it. Yeah. You could use other things. You use thistle. You can use uh cattails. You can use um, the dandelions, um, but none of it really works as well. It works. Yeah. And it works probably good enough, but not yeah. quite. There's something about milkweed. I do. Um, I knew somebody who was uh, an experienced beast hunter who told me he found that if he took yarn and he pulled it apart to get one strand, it worked really work. well. Um, but I never tried it. I think the thing about milkweed is when it fluffs out, 
it just catches that uh, air current and it can be like dead calm and it still yep. floats with air current, which finds the thermals and everything else it'll float through. If I were you, man, I would get on the forum, the hunting beast forum, and just put a message in there saying you want to, you need some. I bet someone, someone will send you some for the price of the shipping, you know. I mean, some of those yeah. guys in northern, the north, you know, Wisconsin, those, I, even here in Indiana, you can pick it up by the bucket load if you wanted to. So, might be worth trying. D Sizzle, he asks, do you use game trails to reach your hunting spot? or make your own trails to cut down on deer picking up your scent. Do you want me to get that one? Yeah, we can both answer it. Um, I mean, if you can avoid deer trails, that's great. But if you're not, if you're for me, if I'm going into an area, I'm only going to hunt it probably once. And um, I'll use, I can use, I'll use a game trail to get back to somewhere. But then once you're getting to the area where you're close to bedding, but yeah, I'm trying to avoid that deer trail the um, best I can. I'm almost uh, always using game trails. Yeah. There's not no real way to avoid it. And if you get off the game trails, you start making too much noise. And yeah. uh, the way I look at it is I'm going in once. I'm hunting. I'm killing that deer. Or I'm not killing that deer. And I don't really plan on coming back. If I do come back, I'm going to come at it a different way. But uh even if you get, if you make your own trail, deer will take it over. They'll yeah. use the trail. Yeah. You, that's a, one of the big things about hunting evenings. I mean, you getting back there is really hard in the mornings. Um, in a lot of cases in the mornings, I'll take a canoe or a kayak back or come in from a totally different direction. And yeah. uh, it makes it a little more difficult um, because the deer come up the trails, you know, um, especially in the really thick stuff like cattails and stuff. You can't even, you couldn't even go through where there's not a trail. Right. Now in cattails, I have made trails that come in from a different direction and a different way than the deer do. Um, but, uh, you know, they still, when I make that trail, all a ton of deer start using it. So it's still a deer trail. Yep. Yep. That's all there is to it. They, they still want to take the path of least resistance, just like we do. So we end up crossing paths most of the time. Um, this is pretty, uh, I'm going to kind of, manipulate your question here bill this is a good thought like you said what's the difference between baiting bears and deer um you think it would work to bait deer like you bait bears dan instead of people that you know your typical bait baiter is just like throwing bait randomly you know or i guess assume, i assume they are but i wonder if you would put the stuff closer to closer to bedding and and think about the wind and all that if it would work better for people yeah, if if you um, um, take bait and you like corn, if you throw it around like a staging area close to bedding, and then you came back later and hunted it, um, and you left it alone, but only hunted it once, you know, you put enough out that uh, it would last. But like it came off of a corn tree, mm -hmm. those deer would come in like nothing. It'd be like. Uh, your initial scent there would would screw them up. I think I think there there could be really good ways to bait where you could really kill a lot of deer. Mm -hmm. um, just a manipulation thing kind of ain't my thing, but um, yeah, right. I know people that do it and do really well. Um, the difference between baiting deer and bears is that bear can be really hard to to find. And you go into an area you're unfamiliar with, and that, like I said, I don't have nothing against baiting deer um, where it's legal. Um, yeah. but you know, when you go out and you, uh, hunt bears, there de definitely ain't, you know, there could be bear baits around quite a bit, but not nearly as much as deer hunting. I mean, you get out there mm -hmm. and there's 500,000 people deer hunting in Wisconsin with a gun and yeah. every one of them's over the bait pile. It gets pretty hard to, right. to not be influencing that, that movement. Um, there isn't 500,000 people bear hunting. Right. Right. All right. Luke has a question for you, Dan. He says, uh, big woods deer, what would your top three pieces of advice to find and stay on big deer in the big woods be? He says, we need to talk more about big woods. He really is really enjoys it. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the thing about big woods is kind of like, um, you got to find the deer to hunt it. 
so it's r really about uh, spreading yourself out until you either hit sign that tells you a big deer is there. You get a trail camera picture of a deer. You see a big deer. Or you get trustworthy intel, which would be the last one because trustworthy intel is usually rarely trustworthy. But um, it's really about finding the buck. Yeah, you got to find where he lives because there isn't going to be a big buck in every woodlot. There isn't going to be one in every section of the woods. So I think a big part of it is locating that deer, you, you know, covering ground. And once you find him, narrowing your search, you know, narrowing it down to exactly where he's living. Yep. All right. Pharrell asked, how far away do you set up on observation sits? Um, on clear and select cuts. Um, it, for me, it would probably be, you know, neighborhood of 300 yards, or maybe even more. Yeah. You know, I got to be able to clearly see the deer with my optics, but I want to be as far away as possible. And I want to be in a spot where that deer is very, very unlikely to go over to. Yeah. Like near a road, near a parking spot or near, you know, someplace right. where there's no food or a tangle in between you and the deer or some obstacle to keep that deer like a river from getting over by you. Um, because otherwise it makes the, um, observation worthless if he right. comes through smells where you were um but uh as far as possible probably pushing three or four hundred yards in most cases yeah i would agree nolan cool he has a late season question there you go there's something different right this time of year <laughs> he said have you had success during that second rut that people talk about in december yes yeah um, yeah, I've seen uh, plenty of rut movement um, with mature box um, in the second rut and even the third rut. Um, but it is very spotty and not nearly as intense. Mm -hmm. But you can get bucks moving for a short period of time as the fawns and the does that didn't come into heat re come into heat. Yep. All right. MT, another question. Dan, what do you do with your prototype stands and sticks? That's a good question. Um, on a few occasions, I gave them away as uh, prizes. Um, I know um, the ones that uh, I've worked on with, with Mario, um, he likes to keep them. He, um, you, you know, they, they're personal to him. Yeah. So I let him have them. I do have uh, some real old ones here some uh, old ones I put together that are kind of weird colored and stuff from back yeah. in the early days. Maybe That's cool. Do a sometime. Yeah, that'd be cool. Um, let's see here. Here's a good one. Nevermore asked, he just got CWD here in North Carolina in the county next door. He said, how rapidly should we expect to see a change in the population? Um, that is a good question. Yeah. And my answer would be, um, it depends on your DNR because the CWD is not going to change the population. The DNR will, um, if they regulate, uh, killing all the deer to save the deer, you're going to see a population reduction. If, um, they blow it off, I don't think it'll affect your population much at all. It may in the long term, like if we talk 50 years, but uh, I don't think any short-term population will change at all unless your uh, your game commission uh, decides to start killing a lot of deer. That's what happened here. I mean, uh, you know, they just started wiping them out, and uh, we're still rebounding to where we were, you know, around 2000. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Hi, I'm... I am Jay Minardi. I'm not sure what you're asking, man. I'm going to just skip over that one. Maybe you can reward it a little bit. Um, <laughs> Zach asked, uh, Dan, have you ever tried C4 energy drinks? It's my go-to currently. Hmm. I have not. Maybe I'll have to try them. Which one's the good one? I don't know. 
Zach, let us know. C4, that's like, I used to work out a lot. Used to, I don't need more, but uh, that was a like a pre-workout C4. Now I see those, I see all the like pre-workouts from the early 2000s coming into the gas stations now. It's like stuff you used to have to buy at GNC, you can buy at the gas station now. Uh-huh. Um, Look, I'm trying to find one that's hunter friendly, you know? Like, yeah. uh, I don't like the fact that Monster, uh, um, yeah. Puts a ton of money into everything except for hunting, and they, they won't have anything to do with any hunters. Yeah. Um, I know Mountain Ops, they're big. They, they really market to hunters, but you can't really buy that stuff outside of their website and like Cabela's and Aspro. But we used to have a. And there's other we, ones too, we, Wilderness Athlete. Way back, in, way back in the old days, we had a sponsor with a uh, energy drink that was, um, but it was a Southern company. And they just didn't have any place up here that sold it. And they, you know, yeah, I'd have, I'd have to order cases from them, and it was just pain. So I just dropped yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Dylan, we are not going to be at Deer Fest this year. Nope. Right. It's under new ownership and is back in Oshkosh. Yep. The big thing about Deer Fest, the reason we were there every year is because it was local and it was just easy to just jump there. And, well, local for us, not really Josh, but. Yeah, but But, uh, instead we're going to Michigan. Yeah, we'll be in Michigan. Okay, here's a question that I've, for some reason, like the last week, I've gotten messages about Mario. Where is Mario? Where's Mario? And he's around. He's just busy guy. He's in the kitchen making eggs. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Mario's kind of. He's busy. He's got some uh, things going on in his family, and uh, yeah, he's busy running hunting beast. uh, gear and uh just a busy guy yep yeah and and i guess people are being nosy essentially but what what's going on with mario is it's nothing that mario did it's just something that happens when as time goes on with, you with see a lot of that in uh in this industry i mean um oh my gosh yeah it drives people me uh, you, you know want to do things with with people like me and they get involved and stuff and then it yeah. gets old yeah i mean um for most people, uh, most normal people, it's kind of weird where everywhere you go, people recognize you and stuff. And then you you kind of you filming everything you're doing and stuff like that, and it, it becomes yeah. a job. Um, yeah. Where I think for me and Josh, I think it's a passion, you mm-hmm. know. And uh, um, I think Mario enjoys it a lot, but right now he's real busy, you know. Yeah. But uh, we see a lot of people come into this and, and go out. Um, I think I got a pretty good core group right now with. Um, josh and uh eric and uh you, you know the regular guys that are on now so yeah you know you'll see people float in and float out you know um here and there um you know we will people submit us film and we'll put film up if it's good and uh right just is what it is yep you know yeah it's very i mean this is a full-time job i mean it's and not, not everybody can keep up with it. Like, like me and Dan do, you know, it's just, it's just part of it. It's, it's hard. Um, but yeah, nothing's wrong with Mario and he didn't do anything. People, the, the, the messages are getting are like, want me to tell the gossip of what's going on with him. I'm just like nothing. He's just, life is happening right now for Mario and it's going to happen to all of us. Like it's just, it's just this time of life. Right. Um, I mean, so literally, I mean, I had two people in my family die last week. I'd like to just hang it up for a couple months, you know, yeah, stuff happens, but you yeah. just, you know, for me, it's just that this is my way of life. Yeah. So this is what I do, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, uh, so good asking about it. <laughs> He's fine. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, Buck Norris has a good one. We'll do a few more here. Uh, what is the worst advice y'all have ever received from hunting? And what's the worst gadget you bought and regret, which is for me, the same thing. Um, that's stupid. <laughs> that stupid. That stupid spray. We used to use that freaking that the scent uh, remover. Yeah, scent killer and all that stuff all the time. It's like that's so. That's stupid. The stupidest crap ever. <laughs> Dude, we would buy that. I mean, you'd think you weren't. I mean, wouldn't go hunting if you didn't have that stuff in your truck, like back in the day. But uh, anyway. Yeah, gadgets. I never really bought too much for gadgets. I always. Uh... I always looked at them and raised an eyebrow. 
Um, but as far as worst advice, I would say um, that came from my old man. My dad used to give the craziest <laughs> advice on everything. <laughs> uh, the, the doozy would probably be um, he always would get mad at me. He wanted me to do this so bad. He wanted me to put a radio on a talk show. Like he would listen to Paul Harvey because it's yeah. way back. Yeah. And we, he wanted me to put a transistor radio in the middle of a field and sit in a brush at the downwind side. He said, if people are talking on the radio, deer are naturally curious and they'll go downwind and want to peek and see who's out there talking. And he just believed that that would kill deer. And I was like, I was like, I'm not doing that. I'm wasting a day. <laughs> and he'd be like, I'm telling you it'll work. That'd be a funny uh, clip you could do, like a short, like a mm -hmm. like I do a parody, where you could like sit in the tree and then like you got this like Bluetooth radio, you could act like you could just film it, you could just edit it in, you wouldn't have to actually do it, but and then have one of your deer come into the scene or something and you shoot it and be like, Dad was right. <laughs> <laughs> um, is Dan a machinist? Mm, I play one at work. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am a machinist by trade and uh, I still work. I still show up every now and then. I haven't showed up all week, but uh, I'm, I'm a machinist. I'm a prototype machinist by trade. So um, I help engineering groups develop new products. That's my uh, business trade. Yep. There you go. Because believe it or not, hunting does not pay a lot. What do you think, Josh? You getting rich over there? No, not not quite yet. Yeah, I'm finally Still. starting to make it as a hunter. I mean, um, I'm finally yeah. at the point where I'm making pretty good money, and I think a lot of that, you know, can have to do with yeah. be secure. But uh, you, you know, a lot of it is the uh, new way you make money off YouTube and yeah. things like that, sponsors yeah. and stuff. Um, so I'm finally starting to make it, but my whole life. Um, really it was the passion in hunting that put me out there for everybody to, um, criticize. Right. Yeah. And, uh, um, it was really wanting to change the, uh, the world. I think that, uh, hunters are, uh, generally better people and I think they're happier people. Um, and I want to see more kids get into hunting instead of drugs and, and uh, gangs and things like that. And I think uh, if they start out successful, they'll stick with it. Right. So my goal has always been to make hunters better people and people better hunters. And that's what's driven me. It's not been money driven or I would have give up on this a long time ago. So uh, machining pays a lot of my bills. Yep. Yep. And I still do consulting work in my old company uh quite a few hours right now um i just got the freedom to tell them to go suck it if i didn't want to for you know a full week or something at any time so i can um, make good, good money consulting for hunting because i get requests yeah. like you wouldn't believe and i did it for a short period of time and i still do it for certain people sometimes i shouldn't even say that because i'll get overwhelmed with requests again yeah but i really don't like the travel lifestyle of just traveling around every day to different farms Truff. and stuff like that. Yeah, it, it is. It's it grows after a while. We're just going to a machine shop and hanging with the guys and having coffee and eating donuts. Yeah, being donuts. home. Yeah, yeah. It's much better than that. Oh, uh, hey, Alec. He asked about uh, some gear stuff. I think me and Dan are gonna, or at least I'm going to before season here is just do like a whole thing of all the gear I'm going to be using. So I'll kind of include all that in there, man. Mostly because I'm not real sure uh, what I'm using yet. My so. plan is to do that too, um, but I want to uh, first uh, get my bows back. Yeah, same. I don't got quite everything I I want to show in my possession yet. Um, Philip the Wise, Dan, do you measure your deer and submit them to Boone and Crock and Pope and Young? No, I do not. I mean, if I shot a, a potential state record or something way up there, I probably would just for the value of it um the value of the antlers or whatever um but i really have no i don't care about it at all yeah i really don't care if they make boone and crockett or pope and young all i care about is if it's a big mature animal and that i enjoyed the hunt to me yeah. um 
the trophy size is more about the way you kill it than it is the animal. Yeah. So for me to take a mature buck uh, on a hunt where I'm hunting that animal, I know where he lives, you know, and you set up in the right tree and you figure him out. To me, that means more than any number. A number is just a um, bragging rights, you know, yeah. among guys. I mean, that's not the that's not to say I don't like a giant buck like everybody else. Right. Of course I do. But uh, what it officially scores does not matter to me. I mean, I would yeah. be tickled pink with a giant four pointer that was like a seven year old buck, you know? Yeah. To, I, I, I would. And that's not to say I wouldn't rather it had twelve points and you know scored two twenty, but uh, I could care less about the score. Yeah. Same. I've never had a desire to put one in there. Um, Danny, we're not going to answer this question. We've answered this question before. He's asking what we think about the Mitch Rampala buck. I actually had to take, I made a clip about it. I had to take it down. It was so, there were so many negative people yeah. on that, on those. Just, like when you, when you talk when about I that. Stuff about Mitch Rampala, I had his kid get all angry and make comments about me publicly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's really it's a very sensitive subject for people. So we just kind of try to avoid it. It gets asked a lot though. It's a very, it's a very clicky subject. Like it's, it is good for us to talk about it because people freaking watch it, man. It was like our number one clip for a while. I just took it down because it was getting so heated in the comments and so many and people were just having like fist fights in the comments yeah. almost. It really, what does it matter? Who cares? Yeah. The guy ain't, yeah. guy ain't going to come out of the woodwork and, and tell the truth or tell what happened or show the buck. Yeah. That's on him. So who cares? Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't and exist as far as that goes. Yeah, I don't think there's any information that me or Dan know that's not already out there publicly where you can do some research and find it yourself and make your own uh, opinion on it. Um, but all right, let's see here. Let's see if we can get a couple more and then we'll get off here. Some of them we've kind of already answered already. I saw one somewhere is about the difference between buck and doe tracks. Did you see that one? No, but we can answer it. We can. Uh, what, what was it? Was it just a. How do you tell the difference between buck and doe tracks? Um, Go for it. I just wanted to give the guy credit who asked, but. Uh, anyways. No, uh, the, care to go up. <laughs> the biggest uh, ways you find difference is. Uh, um, a doe is wide in the hips and narrow in the front, and a buck is wide in the chest and narrow in the hips. So the back feet of a buck, which are smaller than the front feet, the big footprint you're looking at is the front foot of a deer, right? The smaller feet are in the back. Mm -hmm. So when you look at those big feet prints, a doe's footprint will be to the outside, just slightly of the front track, and a buck will be just slightly to the inside because he's got narrower hips than front, right? Um, other than that, a 200 pound animal leaves a dent. Mm -hmm. Those rarely, you, you know, way over, you know, 160, 170 for a huge doe, where big bucks, generally the type I'm after, are over 200 pounds, you know, on the hoof, and uh, they leave a dent. Their feet splay. They leave a big track. They got a bigger foot. So a, a real big track is generally a buck. Now, when it's, you, you know, another thing is that uh, bucks, I believe it's from scraping because they make scrapes a lot, right? Does don't. Does have more pointy hooves, front hooves. Wait a minute, Dan. It depends who you ask on that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Go ahead on the scrapes. <laughs> But from my experience, those yes. don't scrape as much. Okay. So bucks have rounded hooves in the front. Their toes will be rounded. They're worn round. The hoof part. Yeah. And uh, the does have more pointy hooves in the front. Now, I, I guess maybe that makes a difference in different soil types. But everywhere I've gone, I've noticed that bucks have rounded hooves in the front. So there's several ways you can you can tell the difference. Mm -hmm. All right, let's see here. Matt asks, what's the farthest shot you've made on a deer and killed it? Me? Yeah. How about you? 47 yards. Wow, that's a pretty good shot. Yeah, the shot's on the beast, too. It's that 
there's a video on there. It's it was I put it up. It's been a few years, maybe four years ago, but um, it's the one like I scared a doe. I can't remember what I titled it, but I scared a doe through the budding area because I shot the doe, and it ran through the bedding area, and it, it like spooked the buck up, and it walked into me. Uh, anyway, yeah, that's I, my farthest I, shot I've ever made. I don't use a range, or I never have. I'm starting to use one now. Yeah. But I, I used to never use a range finder, so I don't really know. But uh, I would say it's probably just over 40, like 41, 42. There was a 10 yeah. shot at that range. Um, that I believe I was right under range because the arrow sunk right where it was supposed to. Right. But uh, that's about it. There I've taken some longer shots, but uh, it's never yeah. worked real good. Mainly it's when hard. I was young. When yeah. I was young, I used to fling arrows at everything. I didn't know any better. Yeah. What's your comfort zone? That was the second part of the question. Um, 150 yards. Uh, no. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, aim real high. You know, use the bottom cam as a pin. Right. No, my comfort <laughs> zone is probably um, um, probably 15 yards to 30 yards. I really like them in that 20 yard range. Yeah. Yep. If you haven't shot a lot of deer past 30 yards, it's or like aimed at some deer, like aimed at a deer past 30. It gets, it's pretty, you know, you got to really have your stuff together. Yeah. You um, know what too is it's more than just being a good shot on a target. You got to be in the right position in the stand and stuff too, because uh, as soon as you start twerking around and stuff, it's a lot different than shooting a target. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, Frank, thanks for joining the membership, man. All right. There was one other one. Ask. Someone was asking if we're going to have any stands at the Mobile Hunter Expo. I've gotten that question so. quite a bit, quite a bit this week too. I have to ask Mario, but I believe we're going to have some. I believe his yeah. plan is to have some there. I don't know. Is Rick on tonight? I haven't seen Rick. I haven't it seen Rick for a while. Weeks. Yeah, I don't know what his problem is, but uh, he should know. <laughs> if you see him on uh, Facebook, you could ask him. Yeah. Uh, people, uh, people ask me, uh, yeah, people ask me all the time about hunting beast stuff. And I, I really don't know guys like that Mario or, or Rick would be the two guys to ask on that kind of stuff. Cause all I do is ask them whenever you guys ask me. Um, uh, oh, here's a good one. Cause this, this time of year, people are starting to tinker with equipment. What kind of lubrication do you use on your stands? Spit. <laughs> Gosh, <laughs> you uh, want him to send you I some? Yeah, that's what I used to. So I use bull wax and uh, everything. And that, that's a good question because it brings up the point that about this time of the year, a guy should really take his uh, mobile stand and really look it over. Make sure your cables are good. Um, make sure um, the locking nuts are at the right tightness so that you got like that, you know, force movement and everything. And uh, if something needs to be waxed, if something's making noise, now's the time to get everything taken apart, waxed, put back together. And if you take your uh, joints apart, make sure you put new nuts on them. Oh, really? Like lock nuts? Yeah, because uh, well, you can you can use them maybe twice, but they start to wear out. That's a plastic thread, and the tightening, yeah. and loosening, they wear out. Um, but uh, get everything bow waxed up, and uh, just look at the whole thing make sure that you get the right tension because you don't want your your platform to just fall open you know yeah. what i mean because you know as the those bolts from uh the closing and opening closing and open will eventually loosen a little bit and if you get to the point where it just falls open you can have that happen and make a noise advertently in the woods i want everything to be a pull pull the seat down push the seat up push the platform up pull the platform down not where you got to force it or jerk it but it should be a push fit um, if it's done correctly. Um, yeah. And just make sure that everything under is safe. There's, you know, nothing's bent, nothing's, the cable's good. There's no kinks in the uh, cables. You know, look at your straps, make sure your straps are, uh, there's no tears in them. It's not frayed. Yep. I think that's a good question to end on. Um, before we go though, you want to tell them about what's going up on the hunting beast? Here in just a few minutes. Yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, we're on. Um, Me too, until just now. The show is over. I'm going to 
put up a new video. So we got a, a bear hunt going up. Um, Mike from Stealth Outdoors went to Manitoba. Man, did he have a hunt? He had, uh, I don't know, he must have had a hundred different bears come in. Um, heck of a place he went. Um, and uh, he decided uh, that he was hunting for a booner or, or bust. And uh, it's a pretty exciting hunt. He went with his uh, son and he went with um, his nephews. And it's been a while since he went bear hunting. Um, but uh, I'm going to put that up as, I'm going to make it live as soon as I get off of here. Okay. All right, everybody. Sorry if I didn't get to your question tonight. Thanks for all the new members tonight. And uh, talk to you guys early next week. We got a good pod or a good show early next week. I think Lou's going to get on and talk about something. So cool. Look forward to that. All right, everybody. Have a good night. See ya. See ya. Bye.